So let's take a look at how we do randomization. We hold a lottery among volunteers for permanent supportive housing. We then compare those who won the lottery, who are in permanent supportive housing, with the losers who get the usual services. What problems does this solve? Assuming that we have a large enough group of people in both the treatment group and the comparison group, it means that people who have characteristics that conduce to success in permanent supportive housing are as likely to be in the treatment group as in the comparison group. That's the beauty of randomization. This is as close as we can come to having clones or our science fiction parallel universe in the real world. While randomization solves many problems, there's one important problem it doesn't solve, which I'll talk about in the next class. But before we turn to a final method of evaluation, let me ask the question, why not use randomization all the time? The answer is that implementing true randomization is often very difficult. For example, the two groups you're comparing, the treatment group and the comparison group, may attrit over time. It may be, especially in a homeless population, people disappear, so you may not, at the end of the trial, really have enough information to make judgments. Also, there's a phenomenon called contamination, where you hope that people would be randomly assigned to one group or another, but the people actually implementing the process choose people they think should be in permanent supportive housing, so you lose, you lose the very process of randomization. And there may be ethical issues as well. If you consider that many homeless people have mental health problems as well, it may be difficult to get the informed consent that you need to ethically include people in a randomized control trial. Finally, I'm going to tell you about a technique that mimics randomization, but really uses a quite different way of getting there. It's called regression discontinuity. The city has decided to assign homeless people to the permanent supportive housing program based on a set of criteria, including such things as their physical and mental health, their drug use, history of employment, stable housing, their stays in shelter, incarceration. Based on these factors, the city creates an index on which a homeless person can score between one, a low risk of homelessness, and 100, a high risk of homelessness. The permanent supportive housing program will be made available to anyone with a composite score of 85 or above, but will not be made available to anyone with a score of less than 85. Under the regression discontinuity technique, you compare the outcomes for people who are just a little bit over and just a little bit under 85. Why is this like randomization? People who are just a little bit above 85 or a little bit below 85 are virtually identical. It was a totally arbitrary cutoff. So if you only look at people who are very close to the line on either side, you have something very close to a random mix of people assigned to permanent supportive housing and those who did not get it. Before concluding this class, I'd like to talk about the concept of statistical significance and then mention how even a result that is statistically significant may not be practically significant. With respect to statistical significance, even if there's a difference between the treatment group and the comparison group, that difference might be just a matter of chance. What statistical significance asks is, is the difference large enough are the, and under circumstances that would let you say that it's not just a matter of chance, but really is the result of the treatment. Statistical significance is a function of two factors, essentially. One is the size of the two groups, and the other is the size of the difference between them. And finally, a matter of practical significance. Suppose that you have an intervention that is statistically significant. The people in the treatment group did better than the people in the comparison group. The question remains, did they do so much better that it's worth the cost of the intervention? Thus, one might decide that even a program that works doesn't work well enough in a cost-effective way to be worth continuing. So let me briefly review the evaluation strategies we have looked at and give you your assignment for next week. We've examined several evaluation techniques before and after, matching with propensity scores, before and after plus difference in differences, randomization, and regression discontinuity. For your assignment, I would like you to describe how you would use one or two of these techniques to evaluate one of the obesity strategies that we've been discussing so far.